Amen. Now pray with me. Father, I want to thank you for the word of God. We need you to amplify it. We need you, Lord God, to make it plain and clear and simple to us. We want to abide by your truths. Lord God, we thank you. We know with the help of God we can do all things. And therefore, Lord, we solicit your help, your mercy, your grace. And let your word find, uh, provide cleansing for us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Before I go right into the word, I want to thank the Lord for a young man that we hadn't seen in a while, Nicholas DiMartini. Amen. Praise the Lord. So good to see you. Amen. So good to see you. God bless all of you. Now, I want you to listen carefully to this word. The Lord has been dealing with me about this passage and a couple of other passages. Just, uh, just uh, he wanted to just open it up. Just literally uh, open it up so that we can hear. And I want to talk briefly about separation from the world. Yeah. Say that with me. Separation from the world. And Paul, the, the apostles talk like that. They, are talk, they talk, taught that in the early church. They believed in it and they uh, operated in that manner. And they had a lot to say to the body of Christ about uh, their pilgrimage here down on earth, in earth realm. He said, you are strangers and pilgrims and sojourners. He spoke to them like they were to understand that you are just passing through. And this must be our understanding and our attitude concerning this world. We are not here to stay. We cannot take anything with us when we leave. So we must not get attached to anything. Everybody still with me? Yeah. All right. So we are to be in the world, but not of the world. I remember preaching this one time at a, in a city, and there was a minister there. He got slightly offended. But um, as a minister, that's, what we, that's a part of what we preach, right? Uh, this is what Jesus did, and that's what his disciples or apostles did taught so that the body of Christ would be separate from the world. That's, now, some may say, well, what do you mean world? And because the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Well, the world in that sense, he was speaking concerning the inhabitants, the people that live in the world. God so loved humanity, right? That he gave his only begotten son. You know that he wouldn't give his only begotten son for a church or a building, right? Or for material things. He gave his son for the sins of humanity. And so the, in that sense, the Bible says God so loved the world, the inhabitants of the world, that he gave his son to die for the, the, the people of the world. And so the world in this sense is speaking of that, this world system that's under the sway and the power of Satan and influence of Satan. So this is what he's speaking of here. Now let's look at it a little closer. 15 says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And then he makes a profound statement. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 16 says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. He makes another profound statement. Is not of the Father, but is of the world. When we, or as we see ourselves and understand that we are children of God's kingdom, right? Yeah. Then we, being subjects of his kingdom, want 
to align ourselves with what's important to God because we have been born of God. We are children of God. Seeing that we are children of God, we are to grow into mature to become more like him. So we are to develop in this image of who God is and what he's like. So the Bible, this was God's intended beginning. In the beginning, the Bible says, and God, after he made uh, everything on the earth, and that was good, he said. He said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So this is God's intent. This is his original design. And of course, you know the story of sin and uh, how Satan came in, of course, the prince of this world to keep man from remaining in that state. So now John says, first he, in the beginning, uh, introduces himself as one that was an eyewitness of the word of God. Or he handled, he looked upon, he touched, he scrutinized the word of life. So that he concluded that this is indeed God's son, the word of God. And he shares with them about the fellowship that he had and the other apostles had with Jesus Christ. And with the Father. And he shared with them, I want your joy to be full, he says. I want your joy to be complete. I want you to have fellowship with us. I want you to have partnership. And so uh, as he sharing with them these things, he shared certain things. He said, there's a message that we heard from the beginning. And this is what I'm declaring to you now. And that message is this. God is light. And in him, there's no darkness at all. And he stated the uh, qualifications for a person that wants to fellowship with this light. And you know it, you can read it on your own time. Chapter 1 is there. And he goes on even in part of chapter 2. And John is pretty, pretty, pretty... Uh, uh, Blunt. He, there's no gray areas when he's speaking. He says there's light and there's darkness, right? He said there's love and there's hate. That's how he speaks, right? And uh, so there's unrighteousness and there's sin. So he was pretty blunt. And um, so I want to go back now to this passage here that he seemed like as he was sharing about loving the brethren and, and uh, writing to the fathers and the young men, uh, you know, writing to them and the children, the babes. And he just seemingly, it just stops. And it seems almost like it's right out of, not in context, but he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father. Now let's kind of look a little bit in, at each one of these. Three different kind of attitudes he projects. And the interesting thing is 17b says, um, um, 16, the latter part of 16 says, after he mentioned the pride of life, he said, is not of the Father, but is of the world. In other words, it finds its source of origin, not from God. Are you with me? So now that makes us want to really want to know more about then seeing that uh, the lust of the flesh and the eyes and the pride of life comes from a different source. It doesn't come from God. And 
since it doesn't come from God, we want to be mindful of uh, what he's saying, how we respond, and, and how we entertain and embrace the different attitudes. Right? Because we don't want the, our attitudes to be coming from an, a, a source other than God. It can come from ourselves or come from flesh or the devil. So uh, here's what he says now. Um, um, the lust of the flesh, all this in the world, first the lust of the flesh. The writer says, the lust of the flesh means the impulsive desires that originates in the sinful uh, human nature. The impulsive desire that originates in the sinful human nature and results in sensuality and other illicit cravings, cravings, desires that comes from the old sinful nature and becomes improper. And most of the times those desires are in contradiction to the will of God. Did you get that? All right, we'll, we'll give some examples. But first he said there's the lust of the flesh. And remember in the garden when God was speaking to, he spoke to Adam and told him not to eat of the forbidden fruit. And the Bible says, and I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 3. After Satan tempted Eve, and she did eat, or he tempted her, caused her to take a second look. And verse 6 says, chapter 3, and when the woman saw, this is her eyes, sight, right? That the tree was first good for what? Food. She wasn't hungry, right? She could have been hungry, and even if she was hungry, she wasn't to satisfy with that fruit. Are you with me? Because that was forbidden fruit. But when she looked upon it, she saw that it was good for food. That appealed to her flesh, right? All right. So he said, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Remember when Jesus was in the garden or in the wilderness being tempted of the devil? Uh, the devil came back to him and says, if you be the son of God, right? Command this stone that it be made food or bread. Had Jesus yielded to him, no matter what, no matter what, no telling what would have taken place, right? But these cravings and desires, he's speaking of that which is normally interferes with the will of God. Are you with me? So it was not the will of God that Jesus obeyed Satan, nor command stones to be made food. But yet Satan was tempting him with it, right? And so Jesus, of course, he began to speak the words that it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. It tells me now that uh, in order to overcome the desires of the flesh, it is important to have and know the word, right? I'm not getting too many witnesses here. The word of God is that which will keep us safe from yielding to the desires of this flesh. You uh, are like, and I was thinking about that. There is a lot of fleshly desires that we have. Now, I want you to turn with me to Ephesians. I really want you to follow me. I feel like the Holy Spirit is really, really uh, trying to get a message across to us as a body and the people of God. Ephesians chapter 2. We 
When you're there, say amen. All right. The writer of Hebrews, I mean Ephesians, Paul, starts out in chapter 2. He says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Spiritual death. Somebody say spiritual death. Now, and then he, he describes the behavior of a person or people that are spiritually dead. He says, wherein time past you walk according to the course of this world, right? Then he further says, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So Satan was behind he was the one influencing those cravings and those desires. He was the invisible foe that still works in people's lives today. Primarily, people that are unsaved. Now, that's not all. I said primarily. He works in people that are saved as well. How does he work? Well, you got to think in terms of this is why God wants spiritual growth. The difference in a person that is uh, more spiritual and the one that's a babe it has to do with their having grown to discern good and evil. A babe cannot discern evil properly. And so if a babe cannot discern evil properly, the babe is going to be babe and he's going to act like a babe, right? And uh, so uh, what, what, what is so important for us is it's like God says, I want my people to get in my word and become students of the word so that they can uh, have that word in them and not sin against me and have a change of mind see things from God's point of view and understand that we're God's people in, in his kingdom and since you're kingdom people he wants us to have the mind of people of the kingdom and uh, that means what we do during the day will drastically change once we have kingdom mindsets all right, so something we think about. So he says, uh, here Paul is making it clear that there is an evil force that influences the behavior and the attitudes of the people of disobedience or the people that are not saved. That's probably a better way to put it. And um, so he also, to the babe, can influence the babe. What are you saying? The Lord wants, one of the reasons God wants us to grow and understand what's good and what's evil, a lot of times there are attitudes that we can have for years and never change them. But there are attitudes that pleases Satan and the flesh and not God. And it's these constant attitudes that prevail in even baby Christians' lives, that they'll not get to know what's fully acceptable to God until they get into the Word and begin to see from God's perspective and get insight into what's good and wholesome in the sight of God. So that means they will remain on the plane of spiritual infants. Well, you're saying, what do you mean, Brother Heron? If I'm struggling with attitudes, I don't want anybody to say anything to me. If they say something wrong against me, I get an attitude. I don't want to speak to them anymore. Those are, those are characteristics of an infant. And God wants us to grow to the point where we can become long-suffering with one another. Uh, 
person may be able to say bad things about you, but he doesn't want us to get bent out of shape because somebody says or acts bad against us. For the purpose that we were called, that we would show forth the light of God. Having a new nature, the new nature does not function according to the old fallen, Adamic, sinful nature. And so an infant can still operate like a person that's not saved and doesn't have the power in their life unless they grow. Look at somebody say, it is imperative that we all grow. And so you can measure your growth by how you respond to when people treat you wrong. If I'm still acting the same way I did 10 years ago when people treat me wrong, I, I don't talk to them, I shut them out of my life, then that means I'm an infant. I may, I may have a whole lot of word in my head, but I'm still an infant because I have not learned to apply that which I have. It. Oh, y'all got to hear what I'm saying. And so what God is calling for us now is to grow to the point where the word becomes a part of our lives. It gets hidden into our hearts so that we will not sin against him. And when the word of God comes into us, there is a grace that comes with the word. There is a grace that will cause you not to respond in a certain way because the word of God is in you. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against him. David, the, uh, the Bible also says um, that great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them so that means I must now uh, have a new diet of the word of God um, and the more the intake of the word of God um, I have the less I'm going to be offended when things don't go my way uh, are you hearing what I'm saying <laughs> but we are not called that things go our way that's not what we're called to. We're called to be lights. We are called to sonships. And I believe what God was saying as he was looking at this word, I'm saying, oh my God. God is saying, God says, I'm coming soon now. And I want the fruit from my people. Hallelujah. See, it's fruit that God is after. God is not after us playing church every, every week. Isn't that right? God is after fruit. So when I leave and when you leave this place, uh, if somebody steps on your toe wrong, if somebody turn, rolls their eyes at you, then you're not going to roll your eyes at them or you're not going to go and tell your neighbor about how they acted and how they treated you. You're going to just shrug it all off and say, well, that's just where they are. I forgive them, Lord, and keep right on going. Isn't that right? We're talking about growth and maturity. Isn't that right? So it's like we are lights. People need to know how to respond. People need to know how to respond. But unless we grow to the point where we can understand what's proper in the sight of God, we will still have the infant mentality. I ain't going to treat me that way. You're not going to treat me that way. Then that's infantile. So the Lord is calling us. To a higher standard. The word of God. And that's why Paul said. I want you to. Uh, uh, have the full knowledge of God's will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He said what do you mean Paul? And I was talking to the Lord. And he was sharing with me about this. Then he said okay go to Ephesians 4. So I go to Ephesians 4, then he said, brethren, I want you to walk with all, uh, 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 according to the vocation that where you're called with all lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, endeavoring to keep unity in the body. Do you not know that if I go to church and I've got ought against somebody, it's going to affect somebody else. It's going to affect somebody else because I have ought against somebody. But the wonderful altar is here for us to get it right. Isn't that right? Ah, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Every Sunday, it's like God says, here's my altar. Come on to my altar. Make those confessions and turn. No, no, don't keep going the same way, but turn, right? That's true forgiveness. Forgiveness is to turn away from it and make a decision to go another way. That's forgiveness. But if, uh, we said that some other, uh, a few Sundays ago. But if I 
if I repent and keep going the same way, I haven't repented, right? Because repentance is not complete unless I turn and make a decision to do it differently. That's true repentance. So when that happens, now God says, okay, you're ready for more. I'm going to give you more now. I'm going to give you a little bit more meat now. Because you're applying what you hear. You're applying what you know. And uh, so, so, so he said the world, um, all that's in the world, lust of the flesh. Then he said the lust of the eye, lust of the eyes. What are you talking about? Uh, the writer says the lust of the eyes is the greedy cravings that wants what Ever it sees the greedy cravings that won't whatever it sees. Have you ever noticed that when you get, uh, 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 let's say you get a couple of, uh, you get this stimulus check, fourteen hundred dollars, and you're excited. Now it's fourteen hundred dollars more than you had, but for some reason you figure that thing down. You say, boy, if I had another five hundred dollars, uh, uh, y'all hear what I'm saying? <laughs> There's not a lot of gratitude for the 1400 that you didn't have. That greed makes you want, and if I had just a little bit more, now I could do, you know. There's something about this old nature, isn't that right? So what we have to do is keep that thing under. Got to keep it under. Say, you know what? I didn't have $1,400, and God gave through the government $1,400. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to thank the Lord for that. I'm going to thank the Lord for that. Isn't that right? So we have opportunities all the time to put that flesh under because the flesh, remember, it's got to be crucified. It's just not going to volunteer. Somebody said, please, Mr. Flesh, you know I'm trying to serve the Lord. I'm trying to serve the Lord, so why don't you behave? No, it's not going to happen that way, right? Crucified. <laughs> That's painful. Crucified means pain. Isn't that right? We put it to death. Sometimes you'll be hurting and you want to say something. You want to, you know, you want to say something. And, and boy, that flesh is just, why don't you just tell them? Why don't you give them a piece of your mind? You, you don't have to take that. And you're sitting there, you may be steaming, but you say, I'm not going to say a word. Because if I say something, it ain't going to be the right thing. Isn't that right? So you sit there and you won't say a word. And all of a sudden, grace comes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Grace come because you wouldn't yield to it. You wouldn't yield to it. The flesh and the devil, the devil will come a mile a minute. He'll give you thoughts and he'll tell you so many things in a minute when you get mad. They come like bullets. So you have to be careful now. He says, I'm not going to walk that way, devil. I'm not going to do it. So you can bring it all you want to. I'm not going to open my mouth. Not going to say a word. And guess what? After a few, it just starts to die right on down. Die right on down, you know. And that's the way you start to overcome this flesh life, right? So the lust of the eyes, greedy cravings for whatever one wants, you know. And, and you know what? I remember uh, years ago when I first did a long fast, so seven or eight days, I was fasting to, because I was changing in employment. And... Um, I wanted to be sure that the job that I got was more in line with what God wanted. So I went on a, a week's fast, and uh, that was the first time that ever happened. And after the fast, my appetite changed. I mean, I did not want so much as I was eating before. But what he made me see is that that spirit of gluttony was broken. You know, there's so many little influences that evil can influence us, even as we're Christian. But when we come to the point where we can better discern when we're operating in this flesh or when we are obeying the dictates and the cravings of the flesh, you know, you, 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 look, uh, you look on the, on the uh, what do you call the, uh, the internet or whatever, and, and, and you see all this good food. You see this good food, we do it all the time, of course, when you go and try to check a restaurant out. But we, we look at it. But, and so when we look at the menu, we get there and we see, uh, and this happened to me so many times, I end up getting more than I need. And 
here lately, I've had to start changing because I ate and I ate when I should have stopped. So when I leave, I'm a little bloated and I'm over full. My appetite, I did not control it like I should. Now, that does not please the Lord, all right? That pleases the flesh, right? I lusted after my eyes. I saw that, and, and you know, you can get into all kinds of things. You know how lust works, right? Lust after the opposite sex. You can, you can just go off in that. But what I'm trying to share with you is this. As a Christian, we are to grow and develop the more we understand what's good in God's sight and what's not good. The more we grow and apply that, that's how we grow spiritually. You see, because you are no more a God's child when you are born into the kingdom than when you are spiritually mature. His love for you never changes. So uh, you can't uh, say, well, okay, since I'm good, God's going to love me more. No, he doesn't. He loves you as much as he's ever going to love you right now. So once I digest that, then I want to please him more, right? I want to please him more. Doesn't mean I'm going to be out of kick, kick. He's going to keep me from heaven if I'm if I'm truly his child. But what it does mean is this: I can miss, you can miss, uh, many opportunities to be an effective witness for somebody that's observing our lives. Wherever you go, people are observing you. And most of the time, you're not going to know who they are. And so we have, we can have a lost opportunity. But thank God for the opportunities when we yield to God. We don't go after the desires of our flesh. You know, you see that nice car, you know. And, and I can tell on myself, you know, so you can't, can't get me for doing that. I remember someone made a statement about an Escalade years ago. They said, boy, you get an Escalade, that, that, you know, so that's, that's really a ride. Man. So that little thought stayed in my mind. So when I got ready to change cars, I said, Lord, I want an Escalade. But I wanted it because I heard somebody say, well, you got a ride when you got that. Now, when I got that Escalade, it didn't do anything. And furthermore, it wasn't a good ride. So I'm saying to you that there's so many little things that simply will try to get us in a wrong direction. But notice what he said. He that do the will of God. See, it's the will of God as opposed to pleasing ourselves. Ourselves, pleasing ourselves has all to do with selfishness, right? Pleasing God has to do with unselfishness. And so the more we become unselfish, the more we can please God. All right. But the third thing he mentioned was the pride of life. Boastful pretensions and bragging beyond the limits of reality. And it also has to do with accumulation of earthly possessions, materialism, right? So uh, as I thought on that, uh, I, uh, my mind went to Achan. In, in the book of Joshua. God told Israel, okay, now just don't touch the accursed thing. As long as you just keep yourself, I'm going to give you victory. So let, let me read in Joshua chapter 7. Turn there briefly with me, if you will. Are you there? Joshua chapter 7. Now, Israel went out to war, and uh, so they were confident, man. They had, God was giving them victory, so they go out there, and so he sent a few spies, scouts up there to check the, check the, the land of Ai, and, and so he came back. Yeah, hey, ain't got but a few people there. He said, just I tell you what, don't, don't send the whole army. Just send a few hundred people there. You know, ain't, ain't that many. You know, you, we, can, we can deal with them. So they, this is, this is. Their assessment, all right? <laughs> they looked at it and said, well, AI is small. You ain't got many people, so okay. So said, don't, don't, don't send the whole army. Ain't no need to send them. So they, Joshua and them obeyed. Send just a few people, warriors. And 
got up there, and all of a sudden, they, the, the, the people turned on them, and, and they chased them, chased Israel. Man, Israel really was fearful. So Joshua was like, Lord, he fell on his face. God, what happened? You know, God said, get up. He said, Israel is sin. He said, nah, unless you correct that thing, I'm not going to be with you anymore. So, uh, so then they began to inquire of the Lord, who, who, who did it? And here's Achan. He's the one. I want you to look at verse 19. Verse 19 said, and Joshua said to Achan, my son, give I pray thee glory to God, to the Lord, God of Israel, and make confession to him. Tell me what you've done. Hide it not from me. Achan answered Joshua and said, I, he said, indeed, I have sinned against the Lord, God of Israel, and thus, and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels of weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver is under it. His, his desires got the best of him. In spite of what the Lord said, right? Got it. He saw those two garments. They were, they were, I don't know if they were silver or wool or whatever, you know, but whatever they were, he lusted after them and took it in spite of those. So many times the working of the flesh, he's dealing with that which is in opposition to God's will and word, right? And so you see how that happened to Achan. And then, of course, you know what happened to him. And uh, the lust of the eyes, of course. But uh, the pride of life. Uh, again, deals with uh, boastful pretensions and bragging beyond the limits of reality. Person bride, bragging about what they get, you know, what they have and what they're able to accomplish. And uh, uh, and then it deals with other areas too. It can go into the area of knowledge and uh, 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 accomplishments as far as education and all these things. It gets into a big, broad area. But the whole idea is the uh, uh, pride of life. And um, the Bible says, if riches increase, don't set your heart on them. Isn't that right? So it's very important. God don't mind giving us, and he'll let us flourish as long as we can handle it, right? Some people can't handle wealth. Are you, you hear what I'm saying? Some people cannot handle wealth. And they wonder why God's always letting Allowing them to be needy. Now, I, I realize that there's some things, it's God's will that we prosper. But there is a rich man in the Bible. And I'm going to read this. I believe I got that scripture too. Turn to Luke chapter 12. I'm just trying to, I want us to grasp what God is trying to say to us and what he's saying. Luke chapter 12. Okay, if you're there, say amen. All right, now let's look at verse 13. And one of the company, one of the company said to him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. He said to him, Man, who, who made me a judge or a rule over you or divide over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Then he gave a parable. He spake a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? He said, this will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, listen to this now. Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So it is, so is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Riches make themselves wings. And they fly right away. 
Am I offending anybody? Let me tell you what God is saying. And then, listen to what God said. Now, but you, but this, this thing is, is real. This is what God did. Apostles talk. All right. Matthew 4. I believe it's Matthew. No, Matthew. Uh, uh, Matthew 6. Matthew 6. He said, He says, no man can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one, love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. This is a profound statement. This is what Jesus was saying to his disciples. You cannot serve two masters. What he's implying is that the God of wealth and riches will pull on you to do it's his way just like God. And it won't let you go. The more you get, the more you want. The God of the mammon, the money, is just as strong. It'll pull on you. I've run into people, boy, they, they can't make enough. I mean, they and, and, and guess what? Once they get it, they can't even rest. They can't even they don't have peace. They put all kinds of security to protect it and they can't sleep. Oh Lord. But you know what? With what give God gives you, if you let him do it, you can sleep like a baby. You ain't got to be worried. <laughs> let, let, me, let me tell you what happened. I told you this before. Years ago, when I first got my escalade, I was so happy. I love that thing, you know, but anyway, one day, at the time, they said that the there was a demand for that, you know, vehicle, you know, the pickup kind of. So one morning, I got up, and we had, we, was, we had the milk delivered to us at that time. So I forgot, and so it was like 4 o'clock in the morning, the milkman came. I heard something out there. I saw a car door open, and I thought they was trying to take my truck. <laughs> man, I got up and I rushed there. So when I got there, I saw the milkman dropping milk. I said, oh, Lord. Your heart can get attached to things if you don't let God bless you as he want to bless you. Your heart can get attached to it. And if you accumulate it, and, and then it's not going to be the same as when you wait your time. Allow God to bring it to you. Hallelujah. If you allow God to bring it to you, he knows that your heart is in the right place. I must be speaking to somebody on TV. Some of people, they've been wanting so much, they can't figure out why they're always lacking and so on. Try seeking God's will. Try seeking God's will. Forget about trying to get ahead in this life. Try seeking God's will. God will bring you. He will advance you as you are ready because God desires that we all prosper, right? That's his will, but not at the expense of the kingdom, right? Not at the expense of the kingdom. There's a, the story is told about a man. This is a true story. The man was so faithful every day. He'd come in there. He's at the altar. Weeping and talking to the Lord. So faithful. One day God blessed him. With a lot of money. You know that man was not. <laughs> he wouldn't come to church no more. <laughs> Where did brother so and so? Brother so was living it up. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Look at somebody and say, thank God you're not like that. <laughs> Amen. But the God of wealth and riches, they will pull on you. They will pull on you. I remember years ago, I first, after I got educate, educated, got into retails, I was going, I was going, but I was going to make, 
I was going to make some money. I'd been to every network marketing uh, uh, scheme. I've been there and all the little classes they took. I, I done been through it all. But God was merciful to me. He knew that I wasn't ready for that. Why? Because I grew up poor. And there's some characteristics that you develop as a poor person that has to be dealt with. No, you didn't hear what I'm saying here. So God had to teach me about this thing. Wealth don't make you. But I thought it. If I could just get this. No, no, no. People are not going to respect you unless you serve God and do it God's way. Isn't that right? But I'm saying I had to learn these things. And God was so faithful. He's just so faithful because he wants us to prosper and be in health. That's his, that's his plan. That's his will. And so, anyway, we, so we, don't, we, we learn the things. Three things I'm going to give you right fast. I don't want to be long here as I looked into that passage here. One, watch out for misguided affections. Watch out for misguided affections. Misguided, what do you mean? Led or prompted by wrong or inappropriate motives or ideas. Watch out for misguided affections. We don't always know ourselves. But God does. And he's a good father. James, in chapter 4, he says, Whence come wars and fightings among you? Isn't that right? And he makes it kind of plain and kind of blunt with what he said. He says, Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask, receive not because ye ask wrong, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Then he went ahead and said something like this, adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We're strangers. We're pilgrims. We're only passing through. Watch out for misguided affections. All right? Don't. He talk, James talks about spiritual adultery. Matthew talks about the worries and being full of cares of this life. Right? Matthew 6, what I just read. Colossians 3 says, set your affections on things that are above and not on things on the earth. Right? Because you're dead and your life is hid with Christ. In God. Let's watch out for misguided affections. Let's make sure that we're dealing honestly with ourselves. Dealing honest with ourselves. First and foremost is the kingdom. And the second thing that I saw out of this passage that we read today concerning John. Distinguish between the old and the new nature. Distinguish. Make the distinction, right? Perceive or point out the difference. Differentiate. Recognize or treat it as different. The new nature from the old, right? God, Ephesians 2 says, uh, we were spiritually dead and it shows the effects that it has upon them. So since that we are alive now, we operate like children that are alive from the dead. And so we must distinguish between the old and the new. The old nature, the Bible, Paul said in Galatians, he says, let me read it, Galatians 5. He says, This I say, then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. 
And these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. So there must be a distinction between the flesh life and the spirit led life. God desires to lead us by his spirit because as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So we must expect God's leadership in our daily lives as sons of God, born of God. The spirit of God will lead us. And uh, I I told this story often about a friend of mine and uh, God was, was, was wanting him to go to the hospital to pray for the sick somebody. He, and uh, so he got in his car. He had another agenda. And he was going. And uh, <laughs> it's funny. And you've heard it before. And he gets in his car. God said, I want you to go to the hospital. He said, no, God. You know, just like that. No, God. So he was determined. He got in his car and began to switch the ignition on. Because he was determined he had some other thing he wanted to do. When he turned the ignition, he blanked out. When he woke up, guess where he was? He was in the hospital. <laughs> Sometimes God will give us crucial lessons, you know, that you must respond the way I want you to respond. And sometimes he's a little lenient on us, you know. But to him, he knew better. He knew better. He knew God's voice, but there are some areas that he wasn't dead in. So he... He wanted to do this. He wanted to go contrary. What about you today? What has God been saying to you over the weeks and months and years? Are you responding to what he said? Are you doing what he asked you to do? What did he ask you to do? You can't use anybody else and say, well, if they they got in my way, can't do that, right? Individually, we must obey what God gives us. It's so important. And he's talking to all of us, right? And not just in the sanctuary. He's talking to us because we're spirit beings. So that means, you know, I was listening to my wife and, and he's telling her the exact stuff that he's been talking to me the last two weeks. And we're sitting there talking and said, wow, man, God is really talking. Why? Because this is the age of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit wants center stage now. And he's speaking to us in our lives so that when we hear God, the Bible says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Sensitivity to the Holy Spirit is very, very important, right? If I'm going to advance, if you're going to advance, as we're going to advance, then we must become more sensitive to when God is talking to us. Don't shrug it off and just say, well, you know, the Lord said this to me last month, last week, but what did you do with it? Did you obey him? Or did you just glory in the fact that God spoke to you? It is really critical that we obey God. It is so critical because if we're going to be the kind of, not if, as we are going to be, the kind of people that God is making us. The sensitivity to the Spirit of God is so important. As my wife said, the Lord was saying, so God speaks the word, and as we are able to hear and as we are sensitive, he brings it, right? He does it. Because his word doesn't return void. It accomplished what he planned. So somebody said, well, he's been saying that a long time. But guess what? He's using your, 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 your friend, your neighbor, because you didn't hear. Y'all hear what I'm saying? The word doesn't return void. So we must listen now to the Lord, and he will do it. Okay, all right. So number one, as I said, watch out for misguided affections. Number two, distinguish between the old nature and the new nature. The old nature is selfish. The new nature is unselfish. That's one of the chief characteristics. And um, um, let's see. Paul points out the forces which war against believers as they seek to live godly lives. 
the struggle between inflation and fear. Well, what is the answer? What do you do? I mean, what, what, what do you do? Romans 12, 1 and 2. Seat you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is just your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to the patterns, the values of this world's system, the dictates of the flesh that go along. Don't, don't be conformed to that. But rather be reshaped, transformed, metamorphosis take place. Hallelujah. When you hear that word of God, the word of God changes you, gives you a new mindset. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It brings life into dead situation where you think in selfishly. All of a sudden God speaks them and that glory of the Lord and the life of God makes you unselfish it makes you want to do the will of God it makes you want to find out what pleases the Lord it is the life of God that brought us out of darkness into this marvelous light it's that light that he wants to shed on us day by day by his Holy Spirit make us different different we're not like the world we're different hallelujah we're different Everything about us must grow to that difference. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. Distinguish between the old nature and the new nature. Glory to God. Let's yield to the spirit and be mentally prepared. Yield to the spirit. I look back over my life and some things God told me some years ago. I said, Larry Herring, have you obeyed what God told you to do? If not, why not? Isn't that right? I told you I can talk about me now. So. so it's important that we become sensitive to God and obey him. That's where the f success lies. Hallelujah. Hebrews 5 says, strong meat belongs to those that are of mature age. What do you mean? Those basically to those that have learned to distinguish good from evil. Let me tell you something about what used to happen a lot. <laughs> you know, sometimes my wife and I used to have a disagreement, and a thought would come to my mind, and I didn't discern the origin, the root of it. It came from another source. It didn't come from God. So I spoke it, and guess what it did? It brought the fruit of the source. If ever you get upset and you say things and it's making people angrier and angrier and angrier and you're in the relationship with you, then you know you're, what you, where you're coming from, the source is evil. Because when it's coming from God, it makes people want to do right. Isn't that right? No, you hear what I'm saying? How about when God speaks to you? How about when God speaks to you? He says to you in a way that it makes you want to obey him. But when the devil speaks to you, he makes you want to argue. Even when he uses the word of God. There are times where Satan used the word of God on me and spoke things to me. And it made me want to justify myself, made me want to argue. So finally the Lord began to tell me, that's not me. My word doesn't do that. But I'm talking to you, it doesn't make you want to argue with me. If you do, there's something badly wrong. <laughs> but I've found that for the most part, when God speaks to me, it makes me want to obey him. But when Satan speaks to me, this is good for somebody now. When Satan speaks to me, it either makes you feel less than, makes you feel a little bit guilt or condemnation, or makes you want to argue as to why. But it will not bear the fruit of penitence and make you want to change. So even in our listening to the voices, Somebody said, the Lord showed me 
that this woman or this man is so-and-so. Well, what did you do with it? If it was the Lord, it didn't make you shun them. If, it, if that made you shun them, it might have been coming from the wrong source. Because God is love. Isn't that right? And all that he tells you, hallelujah, faith worketh by, by love. So when God speaks to us, he doesn't tell you. And I, tell, I share with this, uh, ministers about this year, discernment. Many people have discernment of spirit, but many are not mature enough to know what to do with it. Sometimes when people, there was an example is told about a, a particular church where uh, the, a person discerned something about the worship team. And they felt like this person shouldn't have been up in the worship team. And they got to the point where they would not even worship when the person and the other was with the team. That was not God. If you get something from the Lord and it makes you act strange, you might want to throw it away because God makes us better, not worse. Isn't that right? God makes us better, not worse. Amen. Amen. So the last thing I want to say is this. Not only distinguish between the old and new natures. Embrace eternal values. Embrace eternal values. The things that are temporal are going to pass away. He said, and the world passes away and the lust thereof. But he that do the will of God remains forever. They transition from this life to the life to come. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I want mine to last. I don't want to, things to stop at this world. There are a lot of people that feel like there's nothing beyond the grave. So they said, I'm going to live it up while I'm here. But they're wrong. There's something that goes beyond the grave. Hallelujah. Colossians tells us about wisdom. And I'm going to close with these two verses, but I want you to think about it. Turn to Luke chapter 17. Why it's important that we learn to walk with God, obey him, and not yield to the dictates of the flesh. Luke 17. When you're there, say Amen. Verse 22 says, and he said to his disciples, the days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you shall not see it. They shall say to you, see here, or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. Because as the lightning that lighted out of the one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first, must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage till the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, are oh, you hearing me? He which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. So important. Now I'll give you one last scripture here. Turn to chapter 21 in Luke. This is why it's so important for us to learn to walk consistently in the spirit and not obey the dictates of our flesh. Luke 21 verse 34 says... And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come upon, come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, 
and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Watching. It helps us to be alert when we learn to walk in the Spirit and obey the dictates of the Spirit rather than the flesh. It's a means to an end. Isn't that right? It's a means to an end. So when you're learning to set aside and crucify the flesh, there's an end result. It leads you to preparedness. It leads you to alertness. It leads you to be able to distinguish good and evil. It leads you to that and cause your life to be ready and on target when the Lord comes. Let's stand and give God some praise at this hour. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Lord, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you because you're good. Thank you for your preparing us for the things that are coming. You love us so much. You care for us, Lord. We thank you. You see the future. You see what's going to take place. You see, Lord. We want to be prepared. And we thank you for your word. And we'll operate as pilgrims now. People that are just passing through will not get attached to things in this life to the point where it moves us, keeps us from the will of God. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We magnify you right now. Let's just take a moment and just honor the Lord. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Reach us today, Lord God. Let your word bring cleansing to our hearts. Cleansing, Father, because you care for us now. Oh, glory.